In this video, we're going to be discussing the Sengoku period, or I should say parts of him. We're going to be specifically focusing a little more on Oda Nobunaga's history. He is known as the Great Unifier of Japan, and probably the most, or one of the uh, most important daimyo uh, samurai in all of Japanese history. Um, again, because he was responsible for the unification of Japan. And we're not just going to be focusing on him, although it's inevitable to talk about him during this time period. Um, as he is probably the main figure um, in most of these events. But we're going to be discussing a little bit about the history before him, talk a little bit about his dad, Oda Nobuhide, and a little bit beyond his death as well, uh, and how the history progresses from there. In particular, I would like to focus a lot on the nuances of these certain battles that happened, how they were won or fought or lost, and, and uh, how exactly they transpired. And shed a little bit of light on this time period of history that is just so interesting and fascinating. Now, with that said, I, I hope I don't come off like I'm glorifying any of the characters in this um, in this story. Uh, that is not my intention. But, you know, I think I'm speaking among adults here, or at least people who are mature enough to understand that this is a story. It's a time period about civil war, and all the main important figures here are warlords, right? So... It's a pretty horrific and bloody time in history. We can't really expect anyone to be nice. Wars were not won by being nice, and countries were not unified or conquered by nice people, right? That I think we're pretty, we can be mature and understand that, that we're not glorifying, even if we acknowledge the intelligence and um, strategy that some of these individuals employ. And this is in no way to vilify uh, the Japanese or Japan or Japanese history in particular. Anybody who's who knows anything at all about history knows that everywhere in the world is exactly the same. The Europeans are not any nicer than the Japanese. Nobody's innocent during this time. Nobody's nice. Nobody's a good guy. It's just not the time period for that. Um, particularly, I am focusing on Japanese history because... I have a tremendous admiration and love for Japanese culture and Japanese history, especially this time period. It's just a cool time period to me. It's just badass. It's a time of 150 years of just straight up nonstop war. You couldn't write a movie that was more interesting than this time period, in my opinion. So, again, this is not exclusive to the Japanese, and I'm specifically focusing on their history because... It's just that cool and that interesting. So uh, with that said as well, I am very sick. My voice is awful. So hopefully it's tolerable. I just couldn't wait anymore to keep putting videos out because I'd like to be consistent about this. But I lost my voice a week ago and I'm finally gaining it back. But it just sounds like I smoke 10 packs of cigarettes a day. Um, hopefully it's tolerable. But without further ado, let's get into it here. And the last thing I will mention as well before we start uh, one thing you got to understand, and if you know anything about history, is you will know that obviously we didn't have cell phones at the time, camera, you know, a lot of these accounts are dubious, they, they can be uh, disputed, so I'm going to be telling you things to the best of my knowledge as somebody who's researched this for many years, but it's inevitable that I might make some mistakes or say something that might be controversial in the sense of, you know, that there's two ideas that are disputed that might not necessarily be fact, but they are accepted as the closest possibility of truth. Um, I might get a year off a little bit. So forgive me. I am doing my best here. If there's anything that I got wrong, just just be aware. I'm just I'm trying my best. And it's a little bit inevitable, right, when we're covering this many this many events and you know this much history where things are constantly happening it's inevitable we'll get some things wrong but i will try my best to not uh, to not mess up too much so our story is going to begin here in 1551 in japan we're going to start specifically talking about the province of Oura owari and again hey i'm a westerner my pronunciation might be off of some of these terms and and uh uh, provinces and names, so apologize again, I'm doing my best. Um, so in 1551, there was a daimyo named Oda Nobuhide. Oda Nobuhide was a pretty accomplished and well-liked daimyo, which is a warlord or leader of a clan of that time, uh, in his own right. 
Uh, in 5051, he dies. Uh, Oda Nobuhide is known as the Tiger of Awari. There are several battles um, that I could list here that he uh, partook in. It's a long list, actually, of why he earned that name, and I won't be focusing on those so much because they're not as interesting. There was the uh, takeover of the Nagoya Castle, uh, the takeover of the uh, Anjo Castle, the Battle of, uh, of Azukiza Azukizaka, the Siege of Ueno Castle. So there is a long list of sieges and taking over of castles in different places that Nobuhide uh, was a part of. So that's why he was a pretty well-respected, well-known and accomplished uh, daimyo in his own right. Um, there might be a video where I focus on earlier time periods of Japan, and I talk a little bit more about Oda Nobuhide, but for this purposes of this video, uh, we will not be talking about him as much. The story starts with him because in 1551, he passes away. Uh, and this is what starts a lot of turmoil among the Oda clan, which will be probably the most important clan we're going to be discussing during this uh, period of the Sengoku period. Um, Oda Nobuhide died, uh, the consensus is he died from some sort of cancer. Um, I think I've heard liver cancer, we're not entirely sure, but it's believed they passed away from some sort of illness, most likely cancer. And in Japanese history, when a leader of a clan, when a daimyo passes away, I've heard daimyo and daimyo, I say daimyo, uh, when a daimyo passes away, it is a very turbulent uh, time for uh, these different clans because there is always a dispute of power uh, at that point. Even if there is an heir or successor uh, that is named, in this case he named Oda Nobunaga, which we'll be focusing a lot on to be his successor, there are still brothers, cousins, and other influential people uh, among the province and the clan who are going to often dispute this um, the succession and will try to grab the power for themselves, think they, think they can do better. So this was a, the beginning of a pretty turbulent time right off the bat of our story, because as soon as Nobuhide dies, he starts by appointing um, his eldest legitimate son, meaning, meaning he had sons that were bastards or from concubines, um, and, and Oda Nobunaga was the eldest legitimate son who was named the heir to the throne in the next daimyo. Um, and that's where our story starts because a lot of his brothers, which we're going to be discussing, and cousins, um, do not like him. He is not a uh, popular guy. He is not, a, he's not well liked at all. He's pretty despised, and we will be discussing why that is. There's pretty good reason why nobody likes him. And it's a very interesting, and many people think it was a bad choice to choose him as the heir. Um, because Oda Nobunaga is known, much like his dad, was known as the tiger of Awar, Owari. Uh, Oda Nobunaga was known as the fool or the clown of Owari. Um, since Obunaga was a kid, he was very perverse and had a very bizarre behavior. Um, and so, but, and he was an interesting guy because he befriended people from all social classes, even though he was from a more noble class, a samurai class. He had friends with the sons of retainers, peasants, upper class people. He, he never cared too much about that. Um, but bottom line, he wasn't well liked. And having chosen him as the heir caused even more reason at this time for, um, internal fights amongst this family and this clan um, because again he wasn't well liked at all um, and right off the bat he, he was again he was seen as this uh, kind of like the bad boy of the family like a guy that just had no respect for tradition for ceremony kind of a clown uh, nobody really liked the guy too much um, and we see this right off the bat he to add insult to injury during his father's funeral, it's pretty famously well known that he had a hissy fit for whatever reason. It's not clear why, but he threw a bowl of incense at the at the altar during his dad's funeral and in a way mocked the funeral in several ways. This just added um, fuel to the fire here for his brothers and other members of the clan just not liking him. 
And it wasn't just family members. When we think of a clan, we think of a family. It's not just family. The clan is composed of retainers, servants. It's everybody that is part of this family, either directly or indirectly, by blood or not blood. This guy was just hated. And <laughs> he became even more hated by doing this at his dad's funeral. And ceremony in Japan is everything. It's super important for him to then go ahead and disrespect the memory of his father, who was a very well-liked and respected uh, a leader. It just, again, added insult to injury. But I think this adds, it, it explains, it, right off the bat, we get a sense of um, Nobunaga's character. He's a very rash, decisive, fiery, explosive, unconventional guy, uh, which partly is what his success comes from and with that type of personality personality is a little bit inevitable to come with some level of arrogance and um, recklessness callousness um, and we will see that that is this is a persistent thing throughout his entire life it never changes um, but it was clearly what was necessary at the time because the Oda clan was positioned between two other very large clans who were disputing power amongst themselves all these several clans which we'll be talking about were doing so particularly the two clans which we'll talk about that were in they were in between were ready to crush them from both sides and the oda clan was pretty insignificant we'll talk just a little bit here about the oda clan and its origins we won't focus too much on that but they were a very in a very precarious spot. Not only was there this internal chaos because of the dad, the dad's death, so there was this internal turmoil, but there was also vultures, these two hyenas from both sides just ready to swallow them. So this was a clan that was looking pretty doomed um, right off the bat, even before his dad's death. And it wasn't just... Um, the belief that there was chaos that was going on, we see this right off the bat. As soon as Nobunaga is, you know, um, his dad dies and he takes over the position as the daimyo there of Oda, um, we see the man who was appointed to be the chief counselor of the daimyo commit seppuku, which is a form of ritual suicide um, that they practice at that time. It's like a ritual disembowelment. He kills himself. Um, his younger brother, I believe his name was... Uh, Oh, Nobuyiki, um, Oda Nobuyiki. He was a very well-respected guy. A lot of people thought that he should have been named as the daimyo. He was conspiring to kill Oda Nobunaga uh, and dethrone him and take power for himself. And just a correction, the brother who he executes, his name is actually uh, Oda Nobuyuki, not Nobuyuki, Oda Nobuyuki. So with his brother out of the way, um, there is still more, uh, a, a greater internal problem that Oda Nobunaga has to deal with. And that threat is coming from his cousin, Oda Nobukata. Oda Nobukata is essentially the owner of the other half of the province. They control an army of fairly the same size, which is about 3,000 men, which is not a lot, uh, just to give you a scope of how small uh, the forces of this province are and how unremarkable this clan is we are talking about 3,000 troops um, when there are armies that have 20 30 40 50 thousand uh, troops at their disposal they're battling between 3,000 against 3,000 right um, but again yep uh, Nobukata his cousin is the other threat who controls the other half of the province wants to, to consolidate power and wants the leadership for himself and it's just inevitable that at some point these two are going to end up going to war um, it, to dispute over the leadership of this province. So with the time inevitably approaching where Oda Nobunaga is going to have to face his cousin at battle, there's a little bit of a problem because it's uh, pretty apparent that his cousin uh, has a larger army than him. And uh, so he's outgunned. And what Oda Nobunaga does, which is the beginning of essentially what we see as a, not just a discarding of uh, tradition, but a uh, disregard for class warfare as well. Um, this is a time period around 15, uh, the 1550, 1560, 
The battle in particular happens in 1558, uh, which we'll talk about uh, absolutely. But up until this point, the, the, the battles are mostly, they're divided in classes, right? You have uh, peasant militias, but they're not very well equipped. They're not trained. They're just essentially cannon fodder. And then you have the samurai who are decorated warriors who are more like the knights of Europe that we uh, would know. Uh, Nor Oda Nobunaga in particular, because he needs more numbers to be able to fight this war, he uh, goes ahead and drafts these uh, peasants who are known as the Ashigaru to fight in his army against his cousin. And the difference, uh, what made it unique about these peasants that he conscripted, uh, drafted, is that he properly equipped them. He didn't just you know, give give them a spear and send them out to war. He actually gave them proper armor and proper weapons and proper training. So he didn't really see them completely as disposable. He saw them as a, as an asset, and he knew that, you know, these are peasants and people that not only do they have nothing, but they're treated like complete crap um, by the, the lords and the noble classes above them. So to have this guy who is the daimyo or the new heir uh, warlord from his dad to come down to these peasants you know draft them but not just send them to their death properly arm them and properly equip them and train them so not only do they have the best chance of winning but the best chance of surviving i'm sure that played a role in the desire to fight and the desire to be loyal to Nobunaga because he wasn't treating them as dis discardable or disposable. He would, again, he properly equipped them so they would have the best chance of not only being effective but surviving. They were given armor that traditionally didn't belong to people in their class. Um, so I'm sure that that, that brought a, an immense sense of pride and respect towards the Lord. So as Nobunaga is getting ready to advance his forces uh, and do the inevitable and battle with his cousin, he ends up coming across uh, several weapons from the Europeans, the Portuguese. From my understanding, there is some sort of shipwreck uh, from a Portuguese ship uh, that he acquires and, and uh, takes a hold of the possessions of the ship. And in that ship, there were quite a few... Uh, matchlocks, which are a type of uh, arquebus. Uh, it's a particular type of gun, which is like a musket, like a powdered, loaded, loaded gun, which wasn't completely new to the Japanese at this time. It's not like Oda Nobunaga was the first one to, in Japan, to discover these guns. The, it's my understanding that the Europeans had sold them uh, to the Japanese before. Um, but these, this wasn't a weapon that was very used uh, in warfare for multiple reasons. Not only was it seen as uh, there's not a lot of honor in using it, it's not a traditional Japanese weapon, but it's also a little bit ineffective. Um, the problem with this type of musket, uh, the Arquebus, is that it, it's a long time for you to reload. It's a gun that can often malfunction. A lot of these wars and fights are going to take place while it's raining in the middle of the mud. And as we know, guns malfunction uh, in, in these scenarios. And when you have a war and a fight, which is mostly a melee and bows and arrows that can constantly be shot endlessly, if you have a type of weapon that can only be shot once, and you usually have a limited amount of these weapons because... It's my understanding they're not being produced by the Japanese at this point, definitely not by Oda Nobunaga. Um, if you have to, and they're expensive, if you have to spend X amount of minutes reloading the gun, you're going to get your head chopped off in the meantime. So they weren't really popular, and they weren't really used a whole lot before Nobunaga. But he comes across these guns, and he is the first guy to really make use of them, which, again, shows this um, uh, disposition and open-mindedness um, by Nobunaga to employ new ideas, new weapons, new tactics shows the level of not just callousness, um, but how practical uh, Nobunaga was, which is a very interesting contrast. And I will talk more about this as the video goes on, why he had a combination 
of a few personality traits, but particularly two that made him extremely formidable and dangerous. He was not only a very cold and practical person, but he was also very creative and open-minded, which is interesting because people that are practical tend to be more conservative. They tend to not be as creative. They're very practical, numbers-oriented, right, type of people. And then people that are a little more creative, are a little more emotional, uh, they're not as practical. Um, and Oda Nobunaga shared on both of these traits, um, which in many ways made him a genius. He understands that traditional warfare is dying, things are changing, and he is very open-minded to embrace new technology. Pretty much anything that will help this guy win, he's going to give it a try. He's going to give it a shot. He doesn't care about tradition, doesn't care about anything. Even if something's ineffective, he wants to try it out. If he thinks it can give him an edge, he wants to try it. And he's absolutely fascinated by this gun. It's my understanding that ever since a kid, he already had a fascination with firearms. So when he came across them, it was yet another another advantage that he could, could he could use against his cousin. Because again, we have a war now by armies about fairly the same size uh, between him and his cousin, but one are very well equipped, decorated samurai, and Nobunaga's army is an army of mostly peasants. Um, so any edge, any advantage that he can get, he will take. Um, and he does make use of these, uh, uh, of these uh, muskets. Uh, the archivist, and we'll talk a little bit about how that played out in battle. So, before that, before we get to the battle there of uh, 1558, which is the Battle of Yukino against uh, Oda Nobunaga's cousin that we've been talking about, there was a, another problem that he had to deal with much before this, which was in 1554, which is known as the Battle of Muraki Castle. So he still had a, a deal with the unification of the southern part before he had any chance uh, of advancing against his cousin on the northern part. So before, again, he could even dream about marching to the north and fighting his other cousin, he had a deal with the cousins that were within the southern part of the province and unified that area before we could ever even move north. Um, so at this time, Oda Nobunaga was about 17 years old. Um, and man, at that time, daimyos and, and soldiers in general could often be, in general, could be even as, as young as 15 years old. Um, so it's not uh, abnormal that a 17-year-old was commanding an army, which to us today is, might be a little bit bizarre to put your life in the hands of a 17-year-old. But he was already showing pretty prominent, um, uh, you know, effectiveness in demonstrating that he could be a capable general um, right off the bat starting at this point. So in 1552, the civil war began between Oda Dumunaga and Oda of Kiyosu in Owari. And in response, the Imagawa clan is moving their They're moving west, and this is where they build the Muraki Castle in the uh, s southeast part of Owari. And this is the battle that we're going to be talking about, which was the one of the first, I believe, the first battle that kind of solidified and showed that Obanobunaga could effectively command troops, which is the Battle of Muraki Castle. So Obanobunaga marches towards this castle. He takes on the offensive. And without getting into too much detail, there was a lot of sailing involved, deployment of troops at shore. And it already showed that he was able to coordinate all these troops and properly deploy them and implement uh, strategy within the battlefield itself and he joined his troops it's not like he was commanding from afar and just sending the messages on what to do he was over there with them uh, during the siege of this castle the Moroccan castle and this was again the first time that he is employing this strategy using the arquebuses he did have some help he um, enlisted the help of his father-in-law Saito Dosen who was the lord of the province of Minu, sent him about a thousand samurai. And uh, Oda Nobunaga at this time had about 1,200, 1,300 peasant um, militia um, commoners as well in his army. Had about 500 of them with guns. And this was the first time that we really saw him test out and make use of the arquebus weapons. And he implemented the strategy 
of a rotating volley of fire. Because up until this point, the big, like I said, concern with using these guns like muskets in battle is the enemy will wait out for you to take all your line of shots. And then that's when they know they can fire back and engage on melee because it takes too long to load these guns. So what Oda Nobunaga would do is he would have these lines of fire where the front row would fire their loads, move to the back, the next line would move forward, fire their weapons, move back, and it created this constant volley of fire effect. And that had two very effective strategies and effects, um, effective effects without being redundant, two very effective things that it caused, which one was a suppression effect and the second one was a psychological effect. The suppression effect because normally you would basically duck and wait out the shots to then fire your arrows back, open the gates and charge into a melee. But if the firing of the guns never stops, there's never a point where you can get up and go fight because if there's just a constant barrage of fire coming at you you can't even get up and go to fight so and it creates a psychological effect too where the troops feel helpless it seems like it doesn't matter what they do they don't get a breathing time because the guns are always firing and it created so much so so much of the psychological effect that they completely surrender the castle without them having to invade and totally take it over they, they surrendered because the volley of fire would never stop and I think this right off the bat showed Nobunaga how effective and underused the arquebuses were um, being in Japan and how he could use that to defeat his cousin in the north later. So after taking over the Meraki castle, immediately uh, the next day he marches to the Teru uh, Terumoto castle and he takes it over the exact same way, burns it to the ground and kills everybody that owns the castle. And pretty ruthlessly to show um, to the vassals what happens if you betray your lord. Um, pretty much everything with Oda Nobunaga is, there's a practical reason behind it a lot of times. And he's very big on shows of force to generate fear. Um, so he tends to, throughout his campaigns, you will notice as the story goes that he tends to kill everyone kids women families he doesn't give a shit he just kills everyone to make a point um that's why he's seen as a pretty evil guy um but in this particular case it was mostly a show of force to say hey all these other vassals if you turn against me i don't care if you think i'm a clown if you think i don't deserve to be in power if you turn against me i'm gonna kill every single one of you none of you are gonna get the chance to enlist in my ranks you're not gonna be pardoned there's no bribe that I'm going to take. I will kill all of you. Um, and right off the bat, it signals to everybody that this guy's not to get fucked with because um, he'll kill you, right? So finally, after that happened, it was fairly easy for Nobunaga to unify the rest of the province. The last uh, clan and person that was in his way was Oda Nobutomo. He was uh, one of the Japanese warlords during the same period, the Sengoku period. And he was the head of the uh, Kyosu Oda faction, which was one of the factions of the Oda clan that uh, ruled uh, the four southern districts of the Oari, Oari province. And Oda Nobunaga uh, defeated him as well and consolidated uh, after this the southern part of Oari. And he was now finally able to march north and fight his cousin in the north and unified the entire province at that point. So he finally got done consolidating power in the southern part. He was now the ruler of that area. Now the main battle uh, had to still be fought uh, against his cousin. So just when things seemed to be resolved on the southern part of Awari and Oda Nobunaga was starting to think about getting ready to fight his cousin in the north and consolidate the entire province, there was a situation where Saito, who was uh, Saito Dosen, who was his father-in-law, who sent those thousand samurai uh, to assist him, and it was a military ally. He retired. He passed on the rule to his eldest son, Saito uh, Yoshitatsu. However, what happened is that in 1556, uh, Yoshi Yoshitatsu, he killed his two brothers, and that caused a military conflict against his own father. And so Oda Nobunaga was already allied with Saito Dosen, so he supported him. But Yoshitatsu defeated um, 
Nobunaga's father-in-law, uh, Dosen, Saito Dosen, and killed him in battle in 1556. So now there was another conflict that he needed to deal with and resolve before dealing with the North, which is, shows that everywhere within his own family and ranks, even on the smallest scales possible, there's constant betrayal and attempts of somehow sabotaging Nobunaga and getting him to not be the ruler. So another character here who was uh, Oda Nobuyasu. He was the lord of the Iwakura, Iwakura Castle. Um, he ended up now seeing after the Nobunaga's father-in-law died, he saw that as an opportunity, and he formed a pact with Nobunaga's enemy, uh, Yoshitatsu, who killed his father-in-law, and they joined forces um, to fight against Oda Nobunaga. So Oda Nobuyuki, who was one of these rebels, he's also known as Oda Nobukatsu. He, this guy was just a pain in the ass uh, for Nobunaga because, again, they fought in the Battle of Inu, and Nobunaga defeated them. And he was going to kill his brother, but his mother, his birth mother, uh, Tsushida Gozen, intervened and asked or didn't allow uh, Nobunaga to kill his brother. And then again in 1556, the same brother, uh, Nobuyuki Nobukatsu, goes ahead and rebels again against uh, Nobunaga and is against, again defeated. Um, in his own, in, in, in his castle, uh, the Simori Castle, and he's destroyed uh, by Nobunaga's forces, but he's still alive and doesn't get killed. And again, in 1558, Nobukatsu Oda Nobuyuki again plans to rebel against Nobunaga. And this is when, as I mentioned at the beginning of the story, where Oda Nobunaga kills his own brother, and this is when he was informed by one of his retainers that Nobukatsu, his younger brother, was planning to assassinate him again for the third time and that's when Nobunaga was just done with it and I've seen documentaries and different explanations where it doesn't explain this chain of events it seems that Oda Nobunaga right off the bat found heard a rumor that his brother this this guy Nobukatsu was trying to conspire against him and immediately executes him that is not what happened there were three rebellion attempts and two battles where he conspired and had to be defeated by Nobunaga and his mom came and saved him. And during the third time when this guy still was trying to conspire now to assassinate his older brother, that's when Nobunaga was just done with him. So it wasn't as callous as a lot of historical accounts I've read and listened to make it seem where Oda Nobunaga again just got a tip that his possibly his brother wanted to kill him and just executed him it was not like that there was a series of battles that happened and conspiracies and rebellions that happened allied with other uh, individuals to try to take him over and the third time this happened is when nobunaga was just done with his shit and killed him worth mentioning that the retainer who gave nobunaga uh, this tip that his brother was conspiring to kill him for the third frickin' time. Um, notable to mention the name of the retainer, who is one of his most loyal uh, bodyguards retainers. His name is was Ikeda Tsunioki, and uh, he was a very important guy in Obunaga's life, which not a lot of people seem to know about him. Um, but he's pretty a pretty notable character um, that participated in Obunaga's life for several battles all the way since like 1556 down to 1584 just to list some of the accomplishments and battles that he did he defeated again uh, Oda Nobuyuki who was found guilty of treason uh, by his brother Oda Nobunaga and in uh, 1558 he took over the Sumuri castle in 1556 he was one of the main forces of Nobunaga against the Umagawa against Imagawa Yoshimoto at the Battle of Okehazama, which we will talk a little bit later about the Battle of Okehazama because it happened in 1560. And we're going to talk about the Battle of 1558 first, which was when Nobunaga finally fought against his cousin of the north and unified Yorari province. But this is just mentioning how influential and how many battles and, and important he was in Nobunaga's life, um, this general. 
Also in 1567, he participated in the siege of the castle Inabayama against the Saito clan. In 1570, he was a part of the battle of uh, Anegawa against Yazaki Akaguro castle clan, um, who was the lord of the Inuyama castle. And I'm sorry, these names are difficult for me to pronounce. And I could go on a list. In 1571, he was part of the siege of uh, Mount Hiei. In 1573, he was part of the siege of Makashima Castle. So we could go on and on and on all the way to 1584, which was the last battle. And he died in 1584 during the Battle of uh, Komaki in Nagakure. This is jumping a little bit ahead here, uh, going all the way to 1584. But... Just to mention, this is when this uh, retainer dies. Both him, his oldest son, and his son-in-law are all killed by Tokugawa Ieyasu during this battle, which was the Komaki and Nagakure battle, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about when we get to that point of the history. And worth mentioning that his daughter and another one of his sons did survive this battle. And his, um, his second son, Ikeda Turemasa, succeeded him as the new head of the Ikeda clan after his death. And I understand that, again, I'm trying not to jump ahead of the events, but I just wanted to mention this character. I think he's often overlooked how important he is in Nobunaga's life, how how influential and how many battles he was a part of Nobunaga and how loyal he was. And this is why he tipped off his younger brother. This was a guy that was there with Nobunaga every step of the way, fought multiple battles, and ultimately died uh, serving this lord. And I know we're getting in the weeds here, talking about a bunch of minor castle takeovers and these little battles that maybe nobody's ever heard about, but I think it's worth mentioning even if passingly, because I've seen in multiple documentaries and in historical accounts where these events are just skipped over. Like I told you, it's very common that I've heard, and I used to think, like I said, that Nobunaga's brother, he just got some sort of tip, and then he just killed his brother. It makes him seem more callous and uncalculated than he really is. Nobunaga normally doesn't do things unless there's a reason, and often he's portrayed as a psychopath that just does things just because. And like I expressed here, that's not the case. There has been multiple rebellions and acts of treason before he made the decision to execute his brother. Um, And again, only on the third time he decided to actually do something about it. And this was the loyal retainer that um, tipped him off. So this is where we finally talk about the Battle of Yukino, which was the final battle that consolidated Oda Nobunaga's uh, power over the province of Owari, which again... (laughs) These are all very small-scale conflicts, so it's interesting that there's so much going on because in the grand scheme of things of what's happening, other battles in Japan, this is almost like ants fighting themselves. This is not relevant. These are battles of like upwards of a couple of thousand soldiers fighting each other for very minor victories and internal small struggles. This is the first somewhat significant battle they're all significant but somewhat in scale of a significant battle um, where now the north is going to fight the south of nobunaga and it's finally the last battle to unify the province of owari where again this massive quote-unquote battle is fought between two armies of three thousand soldiers which is nothing um which just goes to show you again how insignificant the oda clan is at this time uh, which is crazy because they go on to be the most powerful clan in Japan and unify the entire country. That's why this story is so interesting, is how such a insignificant and small clan was able to accomplish such great things under the leadership of Nobunaga. So in 1558 uh, occurred the Battle of Yukino, which was fought between Nobunaga and his cousin on the north. Oda Nobukata, who again is his cousin and main rival at this time. And this is where they have their final showdown, showdown, sort of say. And the one do or die kind of battle that's going to decide control for the entirety of the Owari province. So this is a battle that, again, it's an extremely important battle. 
um, that happens in this period. But because it is considered so small scale, I think it's overlooked a lot and not thoroughly explained. And I've heard people give different descriptions of why, spoiler alert, Nobunaga wins this battle and this war ultimately to unify this province of Oari. And again, he's a little bit outnumbered, Nobunaga, and a little under-equipped most likely, because again, this is now an army of peasants against his cousin's army of actual samurai. And how can an army, a smaller army of peasants, beat this larger, more trained and decorated army of samurai? And I've heard really subjective, not very well analyzed um, explanations as to why, such as, oh, the peasants were more determined because they hated the samurai, so they fought more, more bravely, or like these really like groovy do feel good explanations of why they won. And that wasn't the case at all. The reason they won is because of the strategy that Nobunaga implemented, which again goes to show how crafty this guy is. And we'll talk a little bit about the specific tactics that he employed uh, to defeat his cousin in this battle that he was most likely supposed to lose. And again, it had nothing to do with who wanted to win more. Everybody's trying to win. Obviously, there's more to the story than is being led on. And I haven't heard a whole lot of people talking about this. Usually people just say, oh, he won. And they don't explain why or how. Or they will just, when they do offer some sort of explanation, it's very, um, again, up in the air. They, they don't talk about specifics and or cite actual historical facts of the tactics that were used and use things that to me are extremely subjective, such as the desire to win, the will to beat their oppressors who were the samurai as the peasants. They had nothing to lose. Like that can all be true, but that's not really why they won. So up until this point, most of the battles between in Japan between samurais were fought very conventionally between two standing armies that basically go at each other. There were tactics involved, but not a whole lot. It was just basically a head-on charge. And Nobunaga was one of the first to be a little more crafty on how he did things and kind of disregarded the traditional honorable way of fighting or whatever you want to call it. And this was an example because, again, he did use uh, firearms again, which was a huge advantage. He was willing to... He was very open-minded and willing to adopt technology. And he had already now not only tested these guns, but like we talked about on the takeover of a couple castles in most of these battles, he not only proved it to himself and it, it witnessed firsthand the effectiveness of how these guns can be employed, deployed, but he also developed that rotating volley uh, strategy of firing, go back, reload, move up, you know, the rotation volley strategy that I mentioned. So he now had an experience with these guns, a tactic. He knew their weaknesses and their strength. Um, so I've also heard about this battle that it was the first time that Nobunaga employed these guns and he got kind of lucky. Again, that is not true. That is not the case. He had already employed the muskets in battle before, the arquebuses, and he already knew very well how they worked and he already had developed a strategy that wasn't being used at the time to use them effectively. And that's one of the things that helped him win this battle. He employed the same strategy that he used to take over those castles, but not just that. During this battle, instead of charging head on when both of the armies met, both his and his cousin, he divided his army into several small units that hid and waited for once the fighting started, they flanked from behind and the sides um, his cousin's army and essentially flanked attacked them from the back and didn't give them enough time and proper warning to mount a proper defense, right? It's a lot easier when you see the enemy coming, you load your bows, you know, you have a back line that's ready to kill the front line, you have spears to hold off charges of a cavalry, but when you're already engaged in the melee and the archers are not very well protected and the, the troops are somewhat divided, when you flank with another set of units from the back and kill all the, all the ranged weaponry from the back and then attack from the rear while also attacking from the front, think about it. You only can fight one enemy at a time. And if you're fighting the guy in front of you, how are you going to fight the guy in the, on your back? 
If you turn around to fight the guy on the back, the guy on the front is going to stab and kill you. If you keep fighting the guy on the back, you're going to get the guy on the front, you're going to get charged by the guy on the back and get slaughtered. And that's exactly what happened. It was a very decisive battle that lasted several hours. And uh, it was a very decisive victory for Nobunaga because of, again, multiple things that he did. So there wasn't no groovy do. God was on the side of the peasants <laughs> or something like that. No, the, the man was just smart. He, you know, he wasn't a guy to just charge into battle for no reason. He does. and We will see this as we go on the story, maybe in later episodes. And where he's fighting other clans, where he is very decisive, he does attack head on. But there is always a plan, even when he uses the approach of offense as the best defense. It's not just a head on for no reason. There's always a strategy and a way where Nobunaga goes about his battles, which is what made him so successful. And after winning this battle, um, which he finally defeated his cousin and won the Battle of Yukino, Finally, the Orari province was consolidated, and now Nobunaga was the supreme lord of the Orari province in its entirety. But that is just the beginning of this guy's problems now, because even after all these battles, even consolidating the entire province, this is still a pretty small province and a pretty small clan with not a whole lot of troops. Most of the clans, in fact, the two clans that are ready to kill him and surrounding him that I mentioned at the beginning of the story are outnumbering his troops like 12 to 1. So he's still in a pretty bad spot, but this shows the process of how he kind of became who he is, where he gained his experience. I've seen a lot of accounts that skip all of these events that led up to this. It's almost like Nobunaga was just born a genius they tell it like he just come up, comes up with things on the spot. He gets lucky. He tries new stuff. He just, you know, as soon as his father named him the heir, he fought this one battle and won by luck because the peasants really wanted to win against the samurai that they didn't like. And now he was ready. No, there was a lot of battles and strategies that he developed through these little conflicts that happened internally that almost worked in his favor, giving him experience and becoming the extremely uh, notorious general that he's known for being. Now, at this point, it's needless to say that Nobunaga is no longer looked at as the clown or the fool of Owari. Now everybody is afraid of this dude, um, and he's pretty well respected, and he starts being seen as someone that needs to be crushed really quick by his enemies outside of Owari. Within Owari, nobody wants to fight this guy anymore. Nobody wants to challenge him. But from the outside, people are seeing this, and, and they're starting to see him as a threat. And now this is the point where we will probably talk about this on the next part, where now Nobunaga is faced with the biggest threat that he's ever dealt with, which is coming from the to his uh, east, which is a much larger, much stronger decorated clan, uh, the Imagawa, led by Yoshimoto. And the Imagawa clan is looking to take over Kyoto, which is the capital of Japan and where the shogun resides, who's the symbolic president of the country. And it's said that whoever controls the shogun, whatever clan is in charge of the uh, in charge of the shogun, theoretically rules Japan. Right. So it's uh, important, the most important point of interest in Japan to take over Kyoto. And Yoshimoto is looking to advance and get to Kyoto and take over the castle. But to do that, Oda Nobunaga is the province that is right in between this, and he needs to get through him to be able to do that. And the problem is, is that uh, Yoshimoto has a significantly larger army, like 40, 50,000 troops. So they're outnumbering Nobunaga 1 to 10, 1 to 12. So they're basically just going to march through and steamroll over Nobunaga and get to Kyoto. And this is one of the most iconic and important battles in Japanese history, which is why I'm going to stop the video right here, because a lot happens during this battle. And this battle is one of the, again, most famous battles in Japanese history, which is the Battle of uh, Okeha Okehazama. And it is a battle where, again, spoiler alert, Nobunaga is able to defeat an army of forty to 50,000 troops with... Again, a tenth to a twelfth of the size of the army. 
almost like a 300 of Sparta type scenario. But Nobunaga actually does this taking the offensive. He didn't employ the same strategy as the Spartans did, where they, you know, quartered themselves in a valley and force multiplied the enemies as they charged in, which can be something to talk about in another video because it's super interesting as well. He did this, he actually charged them on into battle. And again, this is an extremely complex and interesting and notorious battle in itself. So I want to dedicate the next part of the video to talking about that. So I'm going to end it right here. In this video, I wanted to focus more on the unification of Owari and kind of talk about the uprising of Nobunaga and kind of how he became who he is. Because again, I've seen his road um, to who he is being described as luck, as uh, it just happened. There was not a lot that happened in between, you know, when he was nominated as... Um, you know, the heir to his father. I just see people talking about this one initial conflict between the, the South and the North. And then immediately we jump to the Battle of ok ok Okehazama. And there was a lot that happened in between. And I think it's important to give context as to how this guy became who he was leading up to this battle because it's going to go to show, because he employs inc an incredible tactic, where again, we, we win a battle between 1 to 10 and 1 to 12. How he did that? Well, because he gained all these this experience and tactics from all these internal conflicts that I explained and grew into the leader and the man that he was to be able to win this battle and ultimately unify Japan, which, which trust me, there's a lot more that we're going to talk about if we're still with me for the next videos and how that happens. But this is to set the stage of how th things started. And... For me to throw in the Battle of uh, Okazama into this video would almost be doing it a disservice because, uh, and the video would get too long. Um, I want to cut it right here and dedicate a video exclusively to the continuation of this campaign and this particular battle that is so iconic, almost mythological. It, it, it's so absolutely incredible, incredible what he was able to pull off. It needs a video of its own. If you enjoyed this video and we would like to know how the story continues, um, check to see if part two is already out. It'll probably take me a while to make part two because there's a lot that happens uh, during some of the events that I kind of previewed you to. Um, and also, hey, if you like the video, go ahead and leave me a like. That way I know that you like this type of content. You want me to keep making it. You think I did a good job. Leave a comment. Let me know if I got something wrong or if you think I did a good job or a bad job. I'm totally open for the feedback. I really, really appreciate it when people give me feedback. And hey, if you want to see more of this, consider subscribing to the channel. I'd love to have you around.